that a liberal, pluralist, multicultural, secular, progressive nation state cannot or will not or is not able to deal with Islamic radicalism in the way it should. And it also brings out the fact that a lovey-dovey, hippie, hipster, middle-class, comfortable Christian church cannot deal with radical Islam like it is. And so what I want to talk about is does any of that line up with Jesus? Is Jesus our Lord and our Saviour, the model, the very image of the Father? Is he this lovey-dovey, middle-class, hipster pluralist that lots of Christians in the church want to be? Lots of the comfy mattress is our God Christians want to be. Yeah, one of you guys keep your eyes on Hatun. And I would say if you're a Christian in the park, or if you're anyone who loves justice and freedom, you need to keep your eyes on Hatun at any and every moment. And the reason being is because we know that the police will not guarantee her safety in the park. They won't. They don't have the resources for one, and I'm not even sure that all of them would have the desire to. However, was Jesus our Lord was Jesus our Lord the kind of hipster Christian that we see in the comfy mattresses our God kind of Christianity of the middle classes in England? Well, he wasn't, was he? You see, during the Passover of the Jews, Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables and those who were selling the doves he said take these things away stop making my father's house a place of business his disciples remembered that it was written zeal for your house will consume me now, lots of the middle class, lovey-dovey, hipster Christians of the comfy mattress is our God kind of Christianity want to sanitize Jesus. They want to make him the acceptable middle class kind of person that they are that could come to one of their dinner parties and enter into a nice philosophical conversation. They want to pretend that Jesus, our Lord, was a pacifist. This story in the Gospels is one of my favorite stories. The icons of our Lord whipping the Jewish money sellers and forcing them out of the temple is one of my favorite images of scripture. Because as a working class lad from a council estate who knows a thing or two about having to stand up for himself, I can't get on with the wishy-washy, hipster, comfy mattress, is our God, never ask me to die as a martyr, don't ask me to get in a conflict with anyone, kind of Christianity that makes up so much of the English church. That kind of Christianity is the kind of Christianity that's allowing our brothers and sisters in Nigeria to be butchered as we speak about it. That kind of Christianity is the kind of Christianity that has allowed Christians to be discriminated against, persecuted, bullied, villainized, characterized in the West. But is that what Jesus did? No. He had zeal for the house of the Lord. And what is the house of the Lord today? The house of the Lord is the church. It is the temple of God. It is the people of God. That is where God has made his tabernacle. That is where the Holy Spirit dwells amongst the people of God, the church. And if we are to be like Christ, must we not also have a zeal for the body of Christ? Must we not have a zeal for the people of God that when we see it desecrated, when we see it raped, when we see it abused, that we stand up 
as Jesus did for the temple. Lots of Christians try to pacify Jesus by saying that he just used the whip against the animals. That's not what the scriptures say. Listen carefully to the words. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He drove out the people, the sheep and the oxen. He didn't just use the whip on the animals. He used it on the people as well. There was a ruckus. There was a fight in the temple because a first century Jew is not a 21st century hipster Christian. A first century Jew, if you strike him on the right cheek, what will he do? Will he turn the other cheek? No. He will strike you on the cheek. These money changers believed that they had every right to be in the temple. They weren't just going to roll over. The scriptures is describing a fight. Sorry, wasps love me. The scriptures are describing a fight in which our Lord overpowered the money changers. He drove them out. Christians don't pacify Christ. Nisa Hussein, a convert from Islam, had an assassination attempt on him by Muslims. They tried to kill him in the UK. Christians in Nigeria are being butchered in their thousands. And you lovey-dovey Christians, you hipster Christians, you comfy mattresses are God kind of Christians, you don't want conflict. Well, let me tell you a truth. If you hide, the war will find you. There's no hiding from the Islamists who want to take ground. There's no hiding from the Islamists who want to dominate. Because any space you give them is a space they will take. And any space that you allow them to hold is a space they will keep. There is only one solution to this. We have to take territory from the Islamists. Just as our Lord took territory from those who were abusing the temple of God. Now, I want to be clear that too many of our churches don't want conflict because too many of our fellowships are like a business as opposed to a community of the people of God gathered together in a common identity and in solidarity with one another. They're a business. How many pastors do we know who are making their money out of the church? Too many. Living the high life whilst our brothers and sisters are being killed, whilst our brothers and sisters are being persecuted, whilst our brothers and sisters are living under the threat of death. How many of our brothers and sisters are we willing to sacrifice before we throw away this namby-pamby, wimpy, wet, effeminized kind of Christianity that does not take Christian solidarity seriously, that doesn't take the idea of martyrdom seriously. Now, O oh Christians, Jesus literally said, Jesus literally said, take these things away, stop making my father's house a place of business. If you belong to a prosperity church in Nigeria, or a prosperity church in the UK that has nothing to say or to do about the blood of our brothers and sisters that cries out under the throne of heaven for justice in Nigeria and Central African Republic and the Sudan and Pakistan and Syria and Iraq and Lebanon and Cyprus and Serbia and Armenia where the martyrs are dying at the hands of Islamists if you belong to one of these prosperity teaching con men, you need to think about Jesus' words. Stop making my father's house a place of business. The people of God are the church. They are a body. And when one part of the body suffers, every part of the body must respond. 
Now, my words can be misunderstood. So let me be very clear. I am not arguing for, nor am I supporting, vigilante justice, criminal activity, or attacking the next person that you have a theological disagreement with. I don't support any of that. And if you do that, that is on you, not on me. However, what I am against, what I am speaking against today, is the idealistic, utopian, middle class, wet, weak, spineless, jellyfish kind of Christianity that will not stand up to evil because it feels it has too much to lose. And I'll tell you why if you're a middle class Christian, you don't want to be like Jesus. Because your life is comfortable. You've got a good job. You've got a good wage. You have a nice house. You have a nice reputation. People like you. You're pretty. This is not the way of the Christian. Jesus said that he has come to bring division. Jesus said that he who is not with me is against me. Jesus said that if you choose the world before me, you're not worthy of me. Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. The cross was a symbol of execution. It was a symbol of death, a tortuous death, a bloody death. It was the, the idea of martyrdom that Jesus is talking about. Are you prepared to die for Jesus? Are you prepared to give your life for Jesus? Are you prepared to give all that you are for Jesus? Because if you're more interested in your dinner parties and your nice comfortable middle class life than standing up to an Islamist ideology that right now has put one of our Christian sisters in this park under the threat of death, then you're following the wrong Jesus. You need to get a better Jesus. You need to get better discipleship. Christians, the body of Christ is one. The Islamist doesn't ask if you're a Catholic or a Protestant before they blow up your church. They don't ask are you an Armenian Christian or a Syrian Christian before they shoot up the church? They don't stop to wonder whether you're following reformist Calvinist theology or Armenian theology before they chop off the head. They don't care about whether you're a Protestant, a Catholic or an Orthodox before they would turn you into a second class citizen. Oh Christian, find your strength. Jesus was not a pacifist, nor should you be. And the body of Christ is one, and it is not bound to any nation, state, or any geographical area. So when our brothers and sisters are persecuted in Ethiopia, it is our fight here in the UK. When our brothers and sisters are persecuted in Nigeria, it is our fight in the UK. When our brothers and sisters are persecuted in Pakistan, it is our fight in the UK. And when our brothers and sisters are persecuted in the UK, it is the fight of every Russian Christian, every American Christian, every Ethiopian Christian, every Nigerian Christian, every Pakistani Christian, every Iraqi Christian. Christians discover an international solidarity including the Irish Christians. I'm sorry there's too many countries to go through, but you get the point. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm not supporting vigilante justice. I'm not supporting acts of criminality. I'm not saying the next time you fall out with someone, you should become violent. But what I am saying is that the institution, the ideology of the liberal state is ill-equipped to stand up to the Islamists. We need a better ideology in the West because the ideology of the West has a blind spot for Islam, yep. for its teachings. And I'll tell you why. Because of a category mistake amongst the liberal progressives. The liberal progressives mix religion with race. So when they hear a criticism of Islam, the ideology, they hear racism. And they don't want to be racists 
because they're nice people that have dinner parties. They're pretty people that go skiing together. <laughs> a criticism of Islam is not racism. It's a criticism of ideology. Perfect. I've criticized communism. No one's ever come to me and accused me of being a commiphobe. I've criticized ethno-nationalism. No one's come up to me and said, you are a Nazi-phobe. So why, when we criticize Islam, do they call you an Islamophobe? I've criticized Hinduism, but I've never been accused of racism. I've criticized Judaism, but I was not accused of anti-Semitism. But if I criticize Islam, I'm accused of Islamophobia. The ideology that we are following in the West is not working. We need a better ideology. And that ideology is a muscular Christianity. Not the kind of wet, weak, liberal kind of Christianity preached by the Archbishop of York and Canterbury. That kind of Christianity is just a civil ceremony. It's like the salad dressing on your salad, the icing on your cake. There's no substance to it. There's no real identity there. But as Christians, we have an identity because we are the followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we have a history, the history of the church. Because we have a theology, the doctrines of the church. Because we have values, the values of the church. Because of these things, we have a culture. We don't get wasted like the English do and destroy our bodies on a Friday and a Saturday night getting drunk. We love our families. We share things in common, but not our wives. We as Christians have a sense of identity. We have betrothed to the world monuments and testaments to the glory of our faith from Constantinople in Turkey to Ethiopia to here in London with, um, Saint, what is it, not St. Peter, St. Paul's Cathedral. These are the heritage of all Christians. They belong to us all and they're worth defending as are our brothers and sisters. The institutions that the church are currently relying on to aid persecuted Christians are not sufficient. Voice of the martyrs, you are not sufficient. Christian solidarity worldwide, you are not sufficient. Aid to the church in need, you are not sufficient. Barnabas Fund, you are not sufficient. Christian solidarity worldwide, you are not sufficient. Open doors, you are not sufficient. You are all laudable, you are all good, and I applaud everything that you are doing. And I encourage all of you brothers and sisters to support one or all of the organizations that I've just mentioned. But what our brothers and sisters need in the Islamic world are countries they can call their own. Yes. We need independent countries in the Middle East that are for Christians. We need independent Christian countries in North Africa. We need to liberate land for Christians to live in so that they can guarantee their own security, their own economy, their own way of life. Because frankly, the current international setup isn't doing it. So how can we achieve this? I'm going to give models by which Christians can establish an international Christian defense force legally. I want to be clear. I am not calling for terrorist networks. I am not calling for terrorist action. If you do something as stupid as that, that is on you, it is not on me. The discussion that I now offer is based on working within existing laws. Working within existing laws. I do not support any kind of vigilantism, any kind of individual action, any kind of um, you going out and attacking people randomly. Don't put that on me. If you do that, you're an idiot. Don't do it. What I am talking about now is legally frameworked activity. And I'm going to give a number of different ways that the global Christian community can establish the mechanism for its own security. Option number one, 
The Vatican State is a legally recognized state. It has treaties with other countries. It negotiates like other countries do. It has its own army, possibly the most useless army in the world, but it does have its own army. It's called the Swiss Guard. The Pope can enter into treaties with sympathetic nations like Hungary or Poland or other Catholic countries to re-establish religious fighting orders in the 21st century along the lines of the French Foreign Legion that Christians from around the world can join and can be funded by the global Christian faith and then deployed at the behest of the church to defend Christians. That is legal. America does it all the time. Other nations do it all the time. It would need negotiation, but it is possible. So that's one option. Option number two, that countries like Hungary, like Russia, like Poland, decide that as a principle of their foreign policy, they will use their militaries to defend Christians. If that kind of ideology was to govern the United States and Russia, Christians would be safe in virtually every part of the world with possibly a handful of exceptions. That's option number two, that we influence the governments of the world to defend Christians being persecuted. Option number three, mercenaries. There are countries in the world that accept mercenary organizations. I think America is one of them. I don't know if the UK is. Where such countries allow mercenary entities to exist legally, it is possible for a Christian to establish a Christian mercenary organization that can then act under the proper codes of law to defend Christians so that the Nigerian government could invite mercenaries into to defend Christians from Boko Haram or the Central African government could do so or where governments have broken down and the international community says we need to step in mercenaries could be commissioned to do the job and if a mercenary organization was established legally to operate legally it could then use on the on a christian basis christians could defend our persecuted brothers and sisters i have just given you three legal ways that christians can establish international defense there's a fourth that individual governments collectively agree to allow the formation of organizations similar to the French Foreign Legion as a model, religious organizations dedicated to the defense of Christians, and that they form national agreements that would allow the formation and the basis and the training and the resources of such organizations dedicated to the defense of Christians and would operate under the governance of those countries so that collectively those countries could say that Christians in nation X are being persecuted and that we are unilaterally acting in their defense. God is still calling people to the vocation of arms. There are still Christians who believe that it is their vocation to join the military. I say to all of you, it isn't. Your vocation is to join a Christian military. And the establishment of a Christian military is possible, legally. I am not calling for, supporting, seeking to validate or to justify any acts of individual criminality. Do not hear my talk wrong. I am not saying pick up a crowbar and hit the next person you have a theological disagreement with. I don't support that, nor am I supporting the idea of vigilante justice against groups like the terrorists. But what I am saying is that we Christians are guilty of a fundamental lack of imagination. Our faith does not teach pacifism 
and there are legal ways that we can organise ourselves to defend our own people and our own community. But we lack the imagination, we lack the leadership, we lack the resources, we lack the determination and we lack the ability for now. But Christians, everything that the body of Christ needs, God has provided. All that we need to do is release our skills and abilities to address the needs of the body of Christ, to address the needs of our people. Uh, Christians, we must stand with one another right. because no one is standing with us. No one, no one. When the Christians were being butchered in Nigeria, where was the UN? Exactly. Where was the USA? Yeah. When Christians have been butchered in Central African Republic, where was the international community? Not. They were willing to just ignore it yes. until the Christians started fighting back. <laughs> when Christians were butchered and ethnically cleansed in Iraq, where was the international community? Nowhere no, until the Yazidis were being butchered. And God bless them for stepping in for the Yazidis. But where were they when the Christians were being butchered? Christians, we are not optionless to defend ourselves. There are legal avenues recognized in law by which we can defend ourselves. We are told as Christians that we must obey the law of the land and we should. Which is why I am saying that I don't support any kind of vigilante activity, any kind of terrorist illegal activity. But we are not optionless. All we lack is the imagination. All we lack is the determination. All we lack is the resourcing. All we lack is the resources. Christians, we need better leadership to deal with the problems that the global church faces. There are Christians out there with the skills, the resources, the ability and the influence to make these things happen. And so they should work towards it, work for it, do what is needed politically to make it happen. Right. Speak to one another about what is happening. Unite, organize, train, mobilize and resist Perfect. we christians are not powerless but we have been led by weak leaders for so long that we think we are powerless we are not powerless we just need to recover our strength and our identity no vigilantism but activism that really and legally deals with the issues that we Christians face. Right. God bless you. Praise the Lord.